so with that, um, um, I will uh, pass things over to Deputy Ford Marthel and Dr. Priestley. Um, we're really excited to hear about how our students are getting all the support they need to become strong readers. Um, and if they're not getting what they need right now, what the district is planning to do uh, to change that. So thank you so much. Thank you. And Ms. Sarah is putting up the deck. If you can go to the previous slide, please, Ms. Sarah. Yeah, give me one sec. I'm sorry. No all right. Uh, so next one. So we, we like to start every um, convening and every conversation that we have, um, just kind of grounding ourselves in our mission as a district. And our mission says that every day we provide each and every student the quality instruction and equitable support required to thrive in the 21st century. And I appreciate how Meredith just said, you know, tell us what you're doing to make sure that every student is getting the support they need or what you plan to do. Um, because I think that when you look at this mission, when I look at this mission, I see it as a pretty ambitious mission. Um, I see it as a bold mission and I see it as a mission that if it is actually um, operationalized, it would be pretty revolutionary. The idea of serving and supporting each and every student in our district, regardless of what they look like, regardless of their language or the zip code where they live, is pretty powerful. And what we know, if we're honest, is that there are a few places where that actually happens and SFUSD is not there yet. That it is something that we're working towards and striving to but the reality of it is, is that we have not, we are not yet providing quality instruction and equitable support to every single baby every day. And so I wanna just name and acknowledge that, that Dr. Priestley and I are not gonna come here and pretend and put on a show. We're saying this is the work and this is the work that we're committed to. And so the presentation today is not gonna be so much, how are you making sure that everyone gets it? We're naming right now that everyone is not for lots of different reasons. And we're gonna really try to focus on what is our plan to make sure that every student gets it going forward. Next slide. And so just beginning with the research, um, one of the things that we have said when we talk about the each and every, acknowledging that each and every baby has not gotten that equitable support and quality instruction is we need to focus. And one of our areas of focus uh, for the past several years, quite honestly, and more intently now is a focus on literacy. And that focus, we didn't just make it up. Um, it actually began with the research and this is an image showing you statistics from the national statistics regarding why literacy is important. It's actually a reflection of a long-term study by Annie E. Casey Foundation. And it found that students who were not proficient in reading by the end of third grade were four times more likely to drop out of high school than proficient readers. In fact, 88% of students who failed to earn a high school diploma were struggling readers in third grade. Um, and I don't think that's anything new to anyone on the screen. We've all heard about third grade, right, being the time. Um, what this um, slide also shows is that reading is broken down into five main areas. So we talk about literacy, we're not talking about any one of these in isolation, but all of these together. Phonemic awareness, phonics, fluency, vocabulary, and comprehension. And I would probably add in there to make sure that you're also holding the ability to, to write and express yourself um, with that as well. And so according to the National Reading Panel, it's important to understand that these different parts Again, our different parts, but they all must go together to really implement a comprehensive or differentiated uh, literacy framework. Next slide, please. Actually, go one back, Sarah. I'm sorry, Ms. Sarah. Could I got to say one more thing about that previous slide. Um, the other thing to note is that the National Reading Panel's analysis um, made it really clear there's actually some best approaches, right, to reading instruction. And those best approaches definitely include these five areas that I just named, but they also incorporate explicit instruction and phonemic awareness, systemic phonics instruction, really methodical, methodical uh, ways of improving fluency, and then different strategies to actually enhance students' comprehension. That was what I wanted to say, Sarah. Next slide, please. Um, in addition to that set of data and research, um, during the pandemic, a lot of new trends emerged, right? So national trends and participation for highly underserved populations really stood out. Um, the analysis found that students who did not participate in assessments during the pandemic were more likely to be racial minorities um, among the lowest 30% of scores pre-pandemic. So what we have is a trend that each and every is not real yet, we haven't realized it, a trend that the students who have not been getting access to quality instruction and equitable support typically are students who look like me, who are students of color, who, have, who are um, not um, English language learners at home first, who might live in particular zip code. There's patterns to this and trends, right? 
And then we went into the pandemic and did more analysis, we realized that those trends are just exacerbated. That is nothing new, but now we see more trends that those same students were not able to participate in assessments, which means that their educators weren't able to figure out where they were and then to meet their needs. Next slide. And those were national trends that also played out and continue to play out in San Francisco Unified. And so what we, um, what we realized is our reality um, after doing some analysis pre or post pandemic, even though we're still in a pandemic, is that we know there's a number of our babies who had significant unfinished learning. So over 7,000 of our students did not have any language arts, ELA or literacy assessments in the spring of 2021. So already pre-pandemic, we had babies who were not realizing their potential with literacy and then the pandemic hit and we had access issues, right? And so even more students, we don't know where they are. We didn't know where they were when they came back. Over 12,000 of our students have experienced learning change below the predicted growth. And so what that means is that there's a, there's a, there's a trend in the rate at which students grow um, in terms of their reading apprehend, um, apprehension. And what we realized was that students did not meet the targets that we expected them to meet. Um, impact on focal groups is we had a number of students whose voices were not heard because they weren't logging on and they weren't participating. We had significant absenteeism and we had issues of participation. It says our reality, it doesn't just say our reality post pandemic or during distance learning, because I'm gonna say it over and over and over again. This has been a trend in our system across public education and SFUSD for years. You can easily predict and point out which students will not be meeting grade level standards which students will not be having access and which students are not participating at the highest levels. Next slide, please. So when we talk about this focus on literacy, right? We started with that truth that we're not meeting the each and every and that there are many students that don't have access to the quality instruction. We also did some deeper dives and we wanted to figure out like what else might be going on? What are the root causes that are preventing those babies from accessing that quality instruction? And what we realized, um, we did a number of different engagement strategies. Uh, we included surveys and feedback from teachers, from families, from various PACs and CACs. Um, and then we codified uh, those, that different feedback. And we worked with our research partners at Stanford to determine some root causes. And what we came up with was that it was nothing about those babies, right? But that we actually in San Francisco really lack a comprehensive multi-tiered system of support for literacy. And what that basically means is that our literacy doesn't have coherence, our literacy instruction, sorry, doesn't have coherence, doesn't have alignment, and we don't have a San Francisco way. And so depending on what school you go to, depending on what teacher you happen to get, you're gonna have a very different experience learning to read, engaging in reading and engaging in literacy. The other thing that we found was similar to that of literacy, there's also not very good structures in terms of behavior supports and social emotional supports. And the reason why that matters for an academic conversation is that if, if I'm in the classroom, right, and I, and I, and I cannot um, kind of regulate or understand my behavior so that I can engage and access the content, then that's an issue as well. And so at the end of the day, what we know is that we don't have good systems in our system to make sure that our students have access to quality instruction. Next slide, please. So that be, that's becoming our work. We no longer can just say we need to focus on literacy. We had to stop and really understand what about literacy we need to focus on. And our decision as a system was to say, we wanna focus first on that tier one instruction. We wanna focus, focus first on that first teach of literacy and make sure that every single student has quality first teach, regardless of what school they go to. Really moving us towards that idea of the each and every. So before I go more into the, the shifts that we're gonna make to, to make that happen, um, I really wanted us to first kind of think a little bit more about tier one instruction. Um, and so tier one is really, again, we call it the first teach, but it's high quality grade level instruction that's aligned to state standards. That's what we say is good tier one instruction. In SFUSD, we use a, a comprehensive approach to literacy as our tier one platform. Now, I'm gonna pause right there because we use a comprehensive approach, which means we, we have a framework of sorts, but it is not implemented comprehensively or consistently or with any kind of structure or predictability across our schools. That is what we're saying is our issue. Um, in the implementation of tier one, we, we have some things that are going well, right? There's lessons and resources that we provide that really emphasize foundational skills and include culturally relevant pedagogy. And we also have some strategies to, to actually differentiate in small groups and at the individualized level. 
We also have ongoing PD and coaching for all of our educators, but it's still an issue of access and reach. Every educator may not go to those PDs. Every educator might not have that curriculum or be implementing it the same way. And so what we're really trying to do is, is get better at our, our, our building of our consistency and our coherence and in our instructional practices, our materials and our curriculum across schools. We wanna get better at actually how we implement whatever we say it is that we're gonna do instructionally. And that includes finance and decoding as well as other components of the reading block. I have to say that one more time. Our focus on literacy and our strategy to improve literacy outcomes for our students and make sure we reach each and every is not rooted in a curriculum. It's really rooted first in us understanding, are we doing what we say we're gonna do? Are we making sure our teachers have the skill set, the knowledge and information they need and the resources to teach what we're asking them to teach? Do we have systems to make sure that's actually being taught? And is it across our system? So consistency and coherence and alignment in tier one instruction is our first way to address the literacy issues that we see. Next slide. So that's just a recap. We wanna make sure that we have high quality instruction. And for us, high quality instruction means the curriculum, yes, but also the teaching practices or the pedagogy and the learning environment in which it's happening. Next slide. Okay, Dr. Priest, I'm gonna go faster now because I know you're, you're about to be up. Um, so that's a lot, right? It, we're a huge system. Um, I don't even know every teacher in, in our districts, right? We have over a hundred schools. So how in the world are we gonna make this big shift to make sure that every single classroom, every single day is implementing reading instruction in a way that is research-based and strong and data informed. And so we know it's gonna take some time to make that happen, to spread it across our system, but we're starting to do that work now. Started a while ago, but we're starting now around the idea of coherence and consistency. So the first thing we wanted to do is we said, we're gonna make three shifts this year. And that first shift is we said, when we get back into the school buildings, friends, we are not gonna remediate our kids. We're actually gonna focus on acceleration and not remediation. And what that means is that even if Meredith missed a whole bunch of second grade, when she starts this year in third grade, her teacher is gonna still expose her to third grade standards. She's gonna get exposed to third grade standards and the teacher's gonna have some strategies to kind of fill in whatever gaps that are there from second grade that are getting in the way of her accessing those third grade standards. That's not instinctual, right? We all are educators who love our babies. And if a student comes in missing a lot of content, sometimes instinct is to say, let me stop right now and reteach you everything you, you missed. The problem with that is that then you never get ahead. And so the research says to keep exposing those babies to grade level standards and have a plan to fill in the gaps or differentiate for those areas that they're not able to access. Our next big shift as a system, next slide, I'm sorry, Ms. Sarah. Our next big, big shift is it's not just the what. I can't just say, engage Meredith. Meredith, you're just the one today because I see your face on my screen, I'm sorry. I can't just say, engage this student in grade level standards and be done right? It's not so much the what only, it's also the how. So we want to start making some shifts in our pedagog pedagogical approaches or the ways in which we interact with kids and have our students interact with the content. And we call that deeper learning. We want our students to engage in inquiry. We want them to ask questions during our literacy block. We want them to be able to collaborate and, and talk with each other. We want them to actually be able to set goals and, and kind of monitor their growth. And we wanna make sure there's actually opportunities for them to get small group instruction. So these are just a couple of things that we're looking at this year. But the one I want you to remember is we're talking about what the students get, which is grade level rigorous content. That's shift one. Shift two is how they get it. It needs to be engaging, they need to be interacting and it needs to be deep and rich. Next slide, please. That's just a cute visual of what I just said. Next slide. And then the third shift is we wanna actually make sure that we're their progress monitoring and we're checking in to see if they're actually getting what we think they should get. We can no longer just teach and then wait to the end of the semester or wait to the end of the unit and say, let me check and see if Meredith got it. There have to be systems in place where all throughout every single day while I'm teaching and after I'm teaching, I'm checking to make sure the students are getting what they need to get and that the students have their own ways of checking for understanding and making sure they're getting what they're supposed to get. And so our next shift is around this balanced assessment system. We need to have real-time assessments during the teach. We need to have summative assessments after the teach. And we have to have a number of different ways for our students to demonstrate their learning. Those are the three big shifts we're making this year. Now it's already November and you probably like, I haven't seen this in any classroom. And I'm gonna remind you, this is a big system. And so we're trying to do PD, 
We're trying to share this information. Um, and the African is going to talk about more ways we're trying to get this out to our school site so that it is something that's real for every student that we work with. With that, I'm going to um, transfer over to Dr. Priestess. She can tell you more about how we actually are trying to make these shifts in our system. Thank you, Deputy Superintendent um, for Morthel. If we can go to the next slide, Sarah. So I'm gonna slow it down just a little bit. I know we wanna have plenty of time for questions, but I do wanna spend a little bit of time of talking about what are we doing? How are we addressing these concerns and how are we sharing information? And we kind of have that in four buckets. Um, one is professional development, others material and resources, instructional coaching and partnership. Um, and I'm gonna start with professional development. Um, as many of you know, we have early release days on Wednesday. And every Wednesday, we offer professional development to all of our teachers um, in literacy and literacy and content areas. And so we are trying to reach our students, I mean, our teachers, regardless of what they teach um, and what school they teach um, and trying to build some coherence and consistency across the district. We also have our central office staff receiving professional development. And we are working with Dr. Goldie Muhammad um, on integrating culturally and historically relevant literacy um, into our tier one framework. And if you don't know Dr. Goldie Muhammad, she is a university researcher and she wrote an incredible book called Cultivating Genius. Um, so if you have an opportunity to look at that and we have been working closely with her for several weeks and we are in the midst right now as we speak um, revising uh, different units uh, in literacy to incorporate the teachings um, that she is sharing and in, in with our central office staff. So you might not see it in schools developing yet. It is, is in the works, um, coming fresh off the press um, and, and arriving in our, our classrooms um, daily. I also want to look at instructional coaching. Um, this is something that has is, is a strength for us in many ways, but we know we need to build it even more. Um, we do have site-based coaching opportunities. That means we go in and work with individual schools. Um, we work with individual teams, um, grade level teams. We work with site leaders. Um, we, we work with teachers. We offer office hours. Um, we have many different strategies for connecting with our um, teachers and leaders at the sites. We also have literacy coaches in many of our schools and we have what's called the Literacy Coach Network. And this year we made our primary focus on phonics instruction, literacy and phonics instruction. And so that's a year long commitment in meeting with our literacy coaches on a monthly basis. Um, we again want to make that work pervasive and have it be accessible in every school and build that knowledge and content in each of our sites. Um, I'm gonna go to the right there for partnerships. Um, you may have heard us talk about this in, in different settings. We're really excited that we are launching um, what's been a long relationship, but we're really taking it to the next level with UCSF. And we're partnering with them around dyslexia um, and, and, and moving in a direction of implementing a screener for dyslexia and follow up with what's the strategies that we could use, um, inside the classroom that could support students who, um, might show up in those screeners. I'm going to hold a little bit on the instructional audit because I have a slide dedicated to that coming up next. So I'm just going to hold on that one. Uh, but we are having an instructional audit on our tier one literacy instruction. Um, but you're going to hear all about that in just a moment, so I'm going to hold. We've also been in the process of um, building up materials and resources that support Tier 1 instruction. Um, we have been building out our classroom libraries. We have been um, building out um, leveled readers. We've also been building out in our middle school um, texts that we um, have worked with our teachers to select that are culturally relevant, along with our um, um, various partners and and we're working on developing anchor lessons and so we are moving in a direction of how can we be more consistent and from central office how can we support that in our classrooms 
um, in our first teach experience for students. So Sarah, can we go to the next slide? So we know we have work to do. Um, I think, I uh, appreciate Deputy Ford Marthel. We wanna be transparent. We know that not every student, um, no, we're not, we know we're not reaching every student. Our, our mission and vision, we know that is the work and we have some steps that we know to put in place and some of these are actually underway. Um, we know we wanna be more consistent about the implementation across our sites um, from classroom to classroom. We know that we want even more opportunities for professional development um, beyond the early release day. And we also want to have more teachers, um, not all teachers um, opt to come on the early release day. We do have hundreds of teachers coming, but we don't have every single teacher coming. We also um, wanna continue with our district-wide focus on phonics and spelling and word study. Um, we know that it's foundational. We know it is key for our early grades and pre-K, kindergarten, and first grade. Research tells us that has the most benefit in, um, in that age span when students are learning to read. And we want to make sure students are having that experience in every single pre-K, kindergarten, and first grade classroom. Um, and we want to be sure that it's consistent, that it's um, um, a day-to-day -day experience, um, and that our teachers are well honed and positioned to teach that. We also want to um, work beyond just reading and writing workshop. We know we want reading to be, the literacy experience to be comprehensive. Um, Superintendent Ford Mathel showed you the five components of reading and she even added in writing, um, which is part of our California standards. So thank you for saying that. We want it to be comprehensive. It's just not one slice of the pie. It is all of those pieces working together. And we also want to have students experience reading in an authentic, um, in an authentic way. So once they develop those key skills early, we also want to transition them, which research supports, um, moving them to having um, using those skills in an authentic setting. We also want to streamline our materials um, as we continue to revise them. Um, you know, we always get better with time. We want to make sure that they are easy to access, that teachers um, have all of the things at their fingertips that they need, um, and that they're organized in a way that is comprehensive and in turn can share that with students in the same manner. And we also want systems of accountability. After we do all of these things, how do we know what's happening and what are the results of it? So how are we going to monitor? How are we going to look at our instructional methods to know if they're working? And how are we going to um, look at our resources to see if they're having the impact that we really want them to have? And so we're going to talk about that as part of our audit. Next slide. So we are working with the New Teacher Project. That is what TNT stands for. And we are in the midst right now of an instructional audit. We meet with TNTP weekly. Um, they are an organization that is well respected in the field, and they are looking at our written curriculum, our taught curriculum, and our learned curriculum. And beginning um, actually just a few weeks ago, we uh, provided them with our resources that we're using in classrooms. We have began a process of reviewing those materials um, with TNTP. Um, working through those materials, answering questions. They are doing a very thorough um, evaluation of our materials, and they will have a report ready for us in January. At that time, they will move on to the top curriculum. And what that means, they will walk and walk our classrooms. Um, they'll walk um, a portion of our buildings, um, go into classrooms, spend time in those classrooms, um, look at the practices that teachers are using and how do students gain access to the content. And that will happen um, from mid-January, probably uh, until late February, early March. And then we'll go into the learn curriculum. What are the students being asked to do? What are their assignments look like? Are they standards based? Um, do they reflect the learning that we want the students to engage in? And we're going to um, review that process in March and April. And again, they will deliver us a report um, on, on the status. So this has been um, a long time coming. When I, I'm gonna say this, when I first came into the district, the first thing I said to the deputy superintendent is we need an instructional audit. And I said that because we need to take stock of what we have, what's working, what's not. And we know that we have issues and we wanna make sure that our next step 
is making the highest leverage move we can make to address the needs of the each and every. We just don't wanna make any move. We wanna make high leverage moves that are really going to provide the most access, the most benefit to our students. And we know that we can't do everything, but can we do the highest leverage things? And we are using this instructional audit to move us in that direction. I think we're moving on to our last slide and I'm gonna turn it back to the deputy superintendent and then we'll get to um, comments and questions, I'm sure. So I think you've, you've heard us say a lot of times this evening um, that we really are working towards coherence um, and alignment in our system. Uh, the truth of our, of our reality right now is that SFUSD um, in many ways, but specifically instructionally and thinking about literacy instruction, it's, it's, it's a thousand flowers blooming. Um, and so the, the audit is an important way for us to understand what's actually happening in our classrooms so that we can figure out what is the appropriate response. I hope you've also heard that we're not waiting for that audit to start responding. I talked about the shifts and Dr. Preeti talked about how we're trying to implement those shifts uh, this year and start to actually permeate what's happening in our classrooms. Um, what you probably are wondering is that you didn't hear us say what curriculum we're using. Um, in the same way that there's a thousand flowers blooming in terms of pedagogical approaches, there are also different curricula in different classrooms. Um, and I, that's embarrassing to say, um, but there is not one curriculum that we can say every third grader at SFUSD is gonna have exposure to. There's probably books in the classroom, but again, back to the audit and the need for the audit, we don't know what's actually being used. We're also honest in saying, we don't think that some of what is being used is actually the most appropriate. And so a part of that audit is to find out what we need to change and shift. All of it though, is because we definitely believe that a strong instructional program requires more than just curriculum, but that it also, and probably more so depends on effective delivery, pedagogy and professional learning. And that's why a lot of what you've heard tonight is really about working on the delivery, getting aligned on the pedagogy and really kind of making a more robust professional learning experience for our educators. And when I say educators, I mean both our classroom teachers and our site leaders. And so what wasn't spoken to is the, the, the um, significant work that's happening with our site leaders so that they can start to be able to identify and work on what good tier one literacy instruction looks like. So they can start walking classrooms and recognize when it's happening and when it's not happening and provide that real time feedback to the educators and that coaching and support. So the last thing we wanted to share with you is that we are trying to get away from a thousand flowers blooming and again towards coherence. And so one of the things that's also in the works is really building an instructional vision for SFUSD. Something that every parent can know about, something that every community member, every student and every educator can know. And so we're in that process now and we're starting at looking at what our graduate profile calls out. You might recall Vision 2025 was made however many years ago. It is now 2021 and we ain't realized it yet. And so we're looking at that vision and we're looking at the graduate profile skills and we're saying, how can we pare that down and get even more specific around what we want our students experience to be? And then how do we actually take that all the way through to really clearly identify the instructional practice we wanna see in every classroom? So that's the, the last piece of the work that we wanted to share with you all. That was a lot, it's 5.32. So we're gonna stop now and open it up to questions and answers. But what we're gonna also do is to commit to you that this is not a one-time conversation, that our hope is to come back and to engage with you um, not only more often, but more deeply. So with that, Meredith, I'm gonna mute my, can't, my phone, my mic. Uh, thank you, wow, <laughs> that was a lot. Um, um, we're gonna get to the live audience questions in, in just a couple of minutes, and I'm gonna go start with a few questions that came through the um, RSVP form, um, but thank you, Dr. Priestley, and thank you, Deputy Ford Marthel. Um, I think it's pretty incredible to hear about all of the work that's underway, um, and I'm, I'm sure everyone here is appreciative to, to have this opportunity to learn about the shifts um, and, and the instructional vision that you're planning to uh, to work towards, um, and um, and and that you're you know offering more conversations beyond tonight. Um, first, what do you see? Um, one of the things that um, there there have been a lot of questions around, like what are the biggest barriers to implementing these kinds of shifts? And um, you know, as you move into this period of these major changes that you're talking about, what do you see as um, the biggest barriers in terms of ensuring that students are effectively taught to read inside their classrooms. Um, you know, what are those barriers that you anticipate? 
Uh, I'll start and then like Dr. Priestley and team. Um, Dr. Priestley, is your team already elevated to, oh, everybody can speak now, right? Everybody's, okay, perfect, sorry. Sorry about that, Sarah. So again, I would say that one of the, the biggest, right, is, this, is the consistency and coherence in practices, right, in materials and pedagogical approach. Um, again, there's, there's not a framework. There's not a way that every teacher is trained on and understands and believes in that's getting implemented. So that's one barrier. The other one I think is that we, we, we need to have space and time to, to collaborate with our educators and really develop um, one shared understanding, but also this, this expertise and knowledge about early literacy and reading development, right? And, and different reading profiles. It's not just, here's a, here's a curriculum, Rebecca, go teach it. it you know, it, as, and you're in the classroom, you, 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 have, you have to be able to be critical of the curriculum and the content which means you need to not only know your standards, but you need to understand reading acquisition and how reading actually happens, right? And so having more time with our educators to really develop that shared understanding, but also let them share best practices is something that we see as a, as a need and something that's honestly something that we're, we're not, we haven't been able to do often and well enough um, starting, but there more work needs to be happening around there. And then just having regular structures in place to analyze formal and informal assessments and figure out our instructional responses, right? To stop and pause, look at that data and reflect. Okay, thank you. Dr. Priestley, did you wanna respond so also? So I'm just gonna follow up on that. I think one of the things um, to follow up on the deputy superintendent, we know that we have, um, so I'm gonna back up. Recently, I've, we have and have been engaging in some conversation with teachers and, and talking about what are the barriers and so we want to hear that from the field. And one of the things that surfaced was the amount of turnover that we have in our schools. We hire, I think about in the last two years that I've been here, and please anyone correct me if you know a different answer, I think it's been about 800 teachers each year. Um, and that's that seems to be pretty consistent. And, and while we are building out opportunities to reach those teachers and, and, and provide them um, support when they're onboarded, um, there's a lot of training that needs to happen around building building their uh, basket, as we would say, right? Building their strategies, building their knowledge. Um, and how do we bring them to the SFUSD way? Like once that established, what is the SFUSD way? And what do we believe in around literacy and um, those high leverage moves and, and understanding the cycles of teaching and assessment and formative and standardized and on that PDSA cycle, um, you know, plan, do, study, act of, of teaching that teachers do on a daily basis. So we have some work to do there, um, but I do think our challenge is just time and, and, and building in that consistency and, and making sure that we have fidelity once it is shared. Like how are we um, monitoring and holding folks accountable at all levels that this is the work that should be happening every single day in the classroom. Thank you. Related to challenges also, we know that the district is in, um, unfortunately, a budget crisis. Um, it, does the budget situation uh, facing our district impact how decisions are made around curriculum shifts or, or you know, literacy program shifts, I should say? We literally just left the budget and business meeting. Um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that it's so much a, a thing about impacting the curriculum, right? But back to what I said before about the professional development, the pedagogy, for sure, as we, as we make these critical decisions um, at the central level, we will be challenged by how do we make sure we're able to provide the professional development to all the teachers in the, in the classroom, right? And so, so those are the things that become compromised is you have fewer folks who are able to provide those professional developments or plan them. Um, coaches and coaching is something that, you know, research says is super important when it's of quality, right? And so as you have fewer folks to coach the teachers as they're coming in or, or to support teachers in their, in their implementation of the curriculum or the analysis of the assessments, that's a challenge as well. I would say also just um, there, there's the, the, the resources that we try our best to prepare and provide for sites that will definitely be impacted as well um, as they will become fewer as we have fewer folks to actually create those resources. Okay. And there's probably a whole bunch of more implications um, that we haven't even figured out, but those are the ones that come to mind um, immediately. 
Okay, thank you for that. Um, I'm not sure if he's here tonight. I know he was on the RCP list, but a few months ago we met with Principal Essien at MLK and we were talking with him about how the literacy levels of students coming into MLK versus students coming into a school like a AP Giannini, um, there's like a 60% gap in the reading outcomes between those students. I'm not sure if I have that number exactly right. You guys know, might know better than I do, but um, something really high that was shocking. Um, uh, do we know anything about what our most effective practices are with our reading results and our reading instruction um, with English learners and um, our Black and Latino, Latin, Latinx and Pacific Islander students and um, like specific schools or, or, or practices that are leading the way with those students? And, and as we make these shifts, are there things that we can do to accelerate faster for those students? So I'm going to start on this one. <laughs> so first I'm going to say we were Nikki, I'm not calling Nikki, but uh, Deputy Superintendent Fort Mothell and I talked at MLK on Friday. So we had um, an opportunity to go in the classroom. We taught sixth grade math, several sections of it throughout the day. And, and even before this, but I do think one of the differences that show up and from classroom to classroom, and we see this with students of color and we see with um, our English language learners is low expectations a lot less to do with the instruction that, that they're receiving, but to the point that we made earlier, students, and, and I think it comes from a good place, but often what we see, um, the response from the adults to the students is, oh, they're struggling, or they can't, or they're having a hard time, let me make it um, really accessible for them, let me really engage them in a way, but it's not always at the content um, grade level that it needs to be, and if they never receive that on grade level experience, they're always behind, and if you have that experience over and over and over again, by the time you get middle school, you will be substantially behind, and that's one of the, I mean, and that's a national, um, you know, well-researched experience for students of color. Um, and particularly across the board is the low expectations. Um, I can tell you a personal story that, you know, I experienced that on my own. And then my mother and father intervened and said, she is cute as a button, but she's gonna learn how to read. And so, you know, that daily um, A, engagement and rigorous grade level content matters. And that's one of the things that we have to, um, you know, sometimes explicitly say, I think we need to explore our, um, you know, our anti-racist framework even deeper. That's something we haven't talked about, but that's something we know we need to bring to the forefront continually. We also, again, need to fill teachers' basket with what are the strategies. Okay, they may not um, have a, a robust literary experience at home, but what can you do in school? How do we how do we change that narrative? How do we change that experience? How do we make it more robust for them? So I think there's work to do around that on a lot of different fronts. I'm just naming one, um, and that's not the whole of the answer. So, um, but I do think there are some things there that we need to um, and what we see. And I do think we see repeatedly in low expectations set for students, and students rise to where we expect them to rise. And so if we're providing that daily, um, you know, rigorous experience, we'll see, and we're providing the scaffolds. It doesn't happen magically. It's not just say you put it out there on the target on the board, it's gonna happen. But we do have to provide some scaffolds. We do have to um, provide a, um, a culturally relevant experience. It has to be engaging. It has to be um, comprehensive. There are a lot of different steps to that. And how do we, um, and how do we make that the experience for every single student in every classroom to the point we've made over and over here tonight, that's not consistent across our district. Mm -hmm. Deputy Superintendent, feel free to fill in on that. I mean, you, you kind of you got it. I just would add that um, I was the assistant superintendent for Bayview for Cheryl Hill before becoming the deputy. So I was on the Southeast side um, and, and Mr. Essien is accurate, right? Sometimes and oftentimes the babies who come into those schools are, are not demonstrating all of their amazing and their brilliance. Um, and that's our work. But one of the things I realized is that it's not unique to Southeast. In fact, unfortunately, the patterns exist around uh, race, around language, around zip code, across our districts. So I can even go to a West Side school and look at our African-American students, our English learners, and I will find that they're actually performing kind of on par to the African-Americans and English learners on the, on the Southeast side. So 
and definitely, I'm not trying to, you all day, brilliant and amazing, okay? My babies are brilliant and amazing. And some of them have more access than others, but I want us to be careful to not think it's just a Southeast thing. Our district and our system has not done well by black and brown students, by English learners, right? By students who come from, from communities with high impact of incidents of trauma, et cetera, across the district. It ain't just a Southeast thing. So I wanna make sure we, we we're clear about that. Um, and so, and we have to keep saying that because otherwise we'll just focus on Southeast instead of saying we're failing the babies who look like that, who sound like that in general, which is a different scaled type of solution. Yeah. Sure. Okay, thank you. Um, I think we have a few hands raised. So why don't we start to go to some of the, the live questions? I'm not sure. Sarah, do you know who was <laughs> who had their hand up first? <laughs> I think it was Megan, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. Me, uh, Megan Patente, do you want to, can you unmute yourself? <laughs> yes. Hi. Oh, there we go. Hi, there you are. Um, hi, thank you everyone for um, this opportunity tonight. Hang on, sweetheart. Um, so, you know, a big question that I have is whether there are plans in SFUSD to move away or to move to curricula and instructional methods that align with the science of reading. Um, you know, I'm, I'm very concerned that balanced literacy does not meet the needs of many students that struggle to learn to read. And since all kids are advantaged by receiving instruction based in the science of reading, including English learners, um, I'm, I'm, I wonder why this instruction is not used in the general ed classrooms and across levels of support. I'll unmute myself because there's background noise in my house. I'll mute myself. So I'm going to start with that, and then I'm going to invite um, some of my team members, Lisa Levin and Katie Eller, who are here with that. So I want to say we have a comprehensive approach, and that's not the same as a balanced literacy approach, nor is it the same as the science of reading approach. But to the point that I think we made earlier, we believe in a, in a comprehensive approach. We believe that students need all five of the elements that we showed on the slide, that they need phonics, phonemic awareness, um, fluency, vocabulary, comprehension, authentic experiences with reading. And so I think there has been um, messaging, and I'm not sure how it's come about, that, that, um, that in SFUSD classrooms, that we solely have a balanced class, a balanced literacy approach. And I don't think that's accurate. What we have um, supported is that all elements we believe in the um, I believe there's very um, um, meaningful you know work that is happening around the science of reading that we need to pull from and that we should use pieces of that yes and and in and in the grades and the places where it's appropriate in our early years we want strong phonics we want strong um, phonemic awareness experience and strong vocabulary experiences. And we want to move students through the phases of reading where they also have more authentic experiences using those strategies, using um, complex and authentic texts, right? So that is something that I want to message clear and loud that we believe that, that we believe in a comprehensive approach. And that's something I want to say that I am intentionally saying out loud here and in other spaces because research would show us the research we use in the clearinghouse um, whereas we, we go for that research would advocate and support that and i believe in a well research uh, framework that we want to put forward but i think we have to pace ourselves in that our audit is kind of is is our step we know that's the direction we want to move in and what's our highest as i stated earlier what's our next highest leverage step to move us to that more comprehensive approach we know we have some gaps we know that what we're doing is not reaching the each and every but we also don't i don't want to come here and say this is the answer and this is how we're going to do it because i think that's been done before and we haven't made that in a very informed and strategic manner and so what we have seen and the reason we're all here now having this conversation because what's happened before didn't get us where we wanted to go, right? So how can we be more um, thoughtful in this process? And, and I am always reluctant to say this is the answer and this one thing is the answer because if it was that easy, it would have happened already, right? And so, and we wouldn't be here having this conversation. So I wanna say upfront, you know, we wanna move in a way 
that is, is research well informed, um, has input that we are working with our expert partners in this work. And what's the next move that we, will take us to um, reaching more of the students in the way that they need to be reached? Um, I, no, I thanks, wanna, Dr. Priestley. I think, I think that's I'm, a really important question. So I want to open it up yeah. to my team too. Yeah. Katie, so I just want to. Um, hi, I'm Katie Eller. Um, hi, Megan. <laughs> um, we used to work together. Um, yeah, I want to also just kind of give some specifics. And I want to specifically speak to what Megan was saying about the science of reading and really thinking about the things that that's advocating for and where in our comprehensive approach to literacy, um, where we're addressing all of those um, elements. And so would you mind, could I share my screen for a minute? Is, do I have that capability? I do that? Okay, great. Because this is an image um, I just want to share, which I know many of you are probably familiar with, which is the Scarborough's reading rope, which is what the science of reading uses as, you know, it's kind of um, its research, its methodology. And um, I'm just going to quickly say that like, there's the two strands, you know, the, the word recognition, which has phonological awareness, decoding, sight recognition, and then of course the language comprehension, which is background knowledge, vocabulary knowledge, language structures, Verbal, verbal reasoning, which is like the inferencing and the making predictions and all of those literary skills. And then the literacy knowledge, which is like how stories go, et cetera. So all of these things wind together to make skilled reading happen. And I know that like um, many of you are probably aware of this research. So where the comprehensive approach to literacy addresses each and every one of these components within um, the whole comprehensive approach. So with word recognition, we address that in our phonics and word study, you know, which is 15, 20 minutes a day, plus another 10 minutes for phonemic awareness routines. And we weave those, that's daily, K1 to third grade. Then we also have the other components though to address um, the language comprehension, which is we have interactive read aloud and we have reading workshop and we have writing workshop and interactive writing and we because it's very important to have the word recognition in context with continuous text and so we also um, put the word recognition into continuous text in those different components. So across the day. Um, across those components, which would be like about a two and a half hour um, to three hour literacy block, we cover all of those areas. Um, so yeah, so I just kind of wanted to share that. Um, that's our approach. And that covers all of the five um, reading components within the science of reading of fluency, vocabulary, comprehension, phonics, and phonemic awareness. So um, hopefully that also gives you some direct um, direct correlation between how our comprehensive approach meets those needs. Thank you, Katie. And thank you, Dr. Priestley. I want to, I know we're getting close to time. So I want to move on to the next question. Thank you so much for that response. Um, this is very thorough and clear. Um, I think, uh, and we're not going to be able to get all, to all the questions, but those who have questions, you can shoot them over to us and we'll try to get them answered by SFUSD. And we can share out like a summary, if that sounds okay to Dr. Priestley and Deputy Ford Morthel, but I know they have a hard stop at six. So let's see if we can get through like two more questions. Um, Rebecca, you had your hand up next. Next. Hi, yeah, thank you, Meredith. Um, and then uh, I thank you. Um, I can't remember who mentioned the um, retention of teachers. And I would love to just say I will invite um, Dr. Priestley and um, uh, Ms. Ford Morthel to our special education meeting with the UESF um, in December, because as we know, special educators, we have the lowest retention rate in SFUSD. So we'd love for you all to make us a priority and come talk to us about that. We think we lose 33% of us every year. Um, so I have a question specifically around SFUSD's position on three queuing. Three queuing or MSV queuing refers to the practice encouraging children to guess words based on pictures and context clues. And I actually looked at some of the new curriculum that arrived in our school today, and it still does this. Um, and it teaches children to guess uh, about words instead of focusing on sounding them out. Cueing is now widely recognized as an impediment to reading development and it is banned in several states. It is also really prevalent, like I said, in Lucy Calkins Readers and Writers Workshop and Fontes and Pinnell instructional materials, which are found in most SFUSD elementary classrooms. And as a special ed teacher, it makes my job harder because I spend roughly one to two months at the beginning of every year trying to get my students to stop doing this. 
So it directly contradicts what we're doing in special education, a negative one and a positive one make a zero for our students. Thank you. Lisa, um, nice to see you all. Thank you for spending your evening with us. Um, so I think where there's some, I think a lot of what is happening right now is there's a lot of like misunderstanding and then misinterpretation. So MS, MSV, meaning structure visual, um, is something, one of the things that we use to collect information about what readers are doing at the point of difficulty. So it's really a tool that we use to observe students um, and observe their reading behavior and kind of notice like, is a student mostly using meaning? Because if they're using meaning, then we really need to teach into the visual. We really need to support that student with like some strategic dec decoding. Um, if we notice that students are and analyze students that they're using a lot of visual information, like all they're doing is sounding it out. So their fluency kind of is chunky and not fluid. And, and we know that meaning for very young readers, like they might look at the picture and to get fluency and get their reading going, they might be able to identify that the, the word says umbrella without having to pause and stop and trying to sound out those long words as a, as a little five-year-old. So MS, MSV, meaning structure visual, is a way that we collect information and observe readers so we can identify what are their strengths, what is the information they're using as readers, and what do we really need to teach into, and how can that inform our instructor, instruction to make them, um, our readers have multiple strategies um, as they read. We also know that for some of our readers, we really do need to break down the visual information for, with them. And we really need to do more pausing and doing orthographic mapping. We really do need to give them time at, um, to understand how words work within continuous text and help make those links. Um, for them. And as we are looking at our instruction, as we're looking at the progress of our readers, and those certainly who were not serving at, as well, um, we know that we're not serving all kids and that we need to really reflect on our practices and think about who, what kids need and how to address it. Um, Katie just put, dropped in the chat an article by Nell Duke on um, MSV um, and, and the prompting around that, um, which is also something that there's a lot of feedback and, um, around. And again, like we're here to learn together, to have conversations, to reflect on our practices, to make sure that whatever we're doing for students, we're, we're all together working to accelerate their reading and literacy growth. Yeah, the, uh, just really quick, the article that I put in there, I know most of you are probably familiar with Nell Duke because um, the science of reading also definitely quotes her often and uses her research and because she's an excellent educator who has decades of research in this. And one thing that she says is like, she also, you know, we would never ever, readers use all three sources of information. We use visual, we use language structure and we use meaning, that's what we do. Um, and she states in there is that visual comes first. Like we need to do that. And we know that we need to um, have students decode and read for that. And we every single time need to have them cross check for meaning and cross check for structure. They need to have all of those that it makes sense. Um, so that article um, states that I'm, it doesn't have, I'll, I'll see about the access because I just took it off of the internet. So you should all have access to it. But anyway, so like, I just wanted to put that in there that it is um, the, all of the research shows that we use all three of those. It's kind of the way that we prompt and we would never ever want students to ignore the visual in order to make sense of reading ever. And we would never prompt for that. So um, that's what I want to say. 
Thank you, Katie. Um, I know we have like we have several other hands up, and we have to let Dr. Priestley and, Doc, and Deputy Ford Morthel go to their next meeting that starts in one minute. Um, so we do have to wrap up. But Sarah just put in the chat. If you can throw your questions into the chat real quick, you can also email them to us at hello at sfparents.org. We'll make sure they get answered and we'll make sure the responses get out to everyone here. Um, if you didn't RSVP through our form, email us so that we know you were here. Um, I know some people send the links out and that's fine, but to make sure that we get the information out to you, uh, make sure you email us hello at sfparents.org. Put your questions in the chat. We'll make sure they get answered. Um, we do need to wrap up. And we want to extend a really huge appreciation to Dr. Ford Morthel, I'm sorry, Dr. Priestley and Deputy Ford Morthel um, for sharing all of this with us. And uh, it sounds like they're even open to another conversation, a part two of the conversation sometime soon um, when we can. And, um, and we wanna thank you all for being here. This is a really important conversation. Um, it's great that we recognize that we need to do better as a district. And it's great to hear that there are some shifts planned. Um, and um, uh, yeah, I don't know, if there's any kind of cl any closing remarks that you wanted to make um dr priestley or deputy ford Murthel, but we really thank you and appreciate you for being here tonight no i just wanted to thank you all for having us um and thank you meredith for um saying again that we are open to more conversations um again we, we came here i think i kicked it off and said that each and every we're not there yet um and we're all committed to being there but we also know that it's complex right the, the reasons for which our babies are not realizing they're amazing and their potential have a lot to do with curriculum and pedagogy implementation, but it has a lot to do, as Dr. Priestley said, with mindsets, low expectations, and a stubborn system that is really intent on certain folks and in certain places. So we, we're trying to, to tackle and disrupt a whole bunch of stuff. And we really want to make sure the message is clear that we don't believe that it is respectful to the complexity of it and to the to the to the deep-rooted racism and other isms in our in our system, right? And in an education period to say that there's one magic answer. But we are committed to working with you all together to figure out what is the answer and what are the many answers or different ways that we can work together to really um, address the needs of our babies. But um, we ain't believers in the one size fits all because it ain't fit for a long time. And so when you hear us kind of struggling and saying we're trying to figure it out and, and, and understand and research is because we're really trying to give the most respect to the fact that this is deep rooted and long standing and complex and not oversimplify um, the work that it's gonna take on all of our parts to really realize the each and every for every single Bubba in our system. So thank y'all, it's been a pleasure. I see a whole bunch of hands up all day. Send us the questions and we'll type the answers, but I don't wanna answer on paper. I actually wanna see you guys again. So looking forward to scheduling with Ms. Meredith um, as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone for being here. We'll do it again, all right? <laughs> um, thank you. Thank you. Thanks everyone, have a good night.